Well, hey, good morning, church. Welcome to Church Online. My name is Pastor Lewis, and I serve here as the English pastor, and I'm so excited to be spending Easter morning with you. Easter is such a wonderful time that we get to gather together as believers, as a church, even through online, even through virtually, we get to gather together and praise the name of God, praise Jesus for what he did on the cross. And Easter Sunday is also known as Resurrection Sunday, the day where Jesus resurrected from the grave and gave us power and freedom over death. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, how Jesus came to give us freedom from death. But before we get into that, I want you guys to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 through 15. We're going to go through a few of these verses. And uh, if you're just joining us here for the very first time, if, if you're new with us, we want to say welcome. We want you to be a part of our family. So in the comments, let us know that you're here or just send us a direct message on whatever platform you're at so that we can communicate with you so you can get to know more about who we are as a church and give you more information on that. We'd love to get to know you. So if you guys are ready with your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to start on today's message. And uh, if you've been following with us in the last couple of messages, we've started a new series that we're calling Freedom. And we're looking through this time of Easter, how Jesus came to this earth to give us freedom. Now you might ask yourself, freedom from what? What do we need to be free from? Well, last week we studied how we needed to be freed from the slavery and the bondage of sin. Sin has us captive from the moment we're born all the way until we pass away from this earth. And sin is something that prevents us from having that right relationship with God. So Jesus came to free us from our sin. On a couple days ago, on Good Friday, we saw how Jesus also came to free us from condemnation. So we no longer have to be condemned by our sin. We have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. That's what his sacrifice was for. So he took our sins and he nailed them to that cross. And today, like I said before, we're going to be focusing on another freedom that Christ gives us. And that is the freedom from death. So I want you to follow along with me as we read through Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. The word of the Lord says this, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than, than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste, taste, everyone say that with me, taste, there you go, taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And then skipping over to verse 14, it says this, Since the children, meaning us, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power. That's an amazing thing. So he might break the power. The power of what you might ask? The power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Church, Jesus came to give us freedom from death. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, I thank you for what you have done for us. God, I thank you for the freedoms that we get to enjoy as being your children. God, I ask you to help us to understand what it means to, to be a child of God and to, to have these freedoms. God, and I pray now that if anybody watching this at home right now has never made a decision to make you their Lord and Savior, God, I ask you that through this passage, they're able to see that you love them, that you care for them, and you want nothing more than for them to be your children, free from slavery of sin, free from the condemnation, and free from the sting of death. So Lord, I ask for them right now, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. So as I said before, the title of today's message is Freedom from Death. Freedom from Death. Tap your, tap your husband, tap your wife, tap your kids, tell them, 
freedom from death. As a matter of fact, I want you to write that down as the title of today's message. And, uh, you know, thinking about death and thinking about the concept of death throughout this whole coronavirus scare, you know, it's a subject that has been on everybody's mind. You know, it's something that has been brought to light in the, uh, in the events that are going on in our lives today. You know, death is a real thing and people are scared to die. People are scared that their family members, that the people around them might contract the coronavirus and they die as well. As a matter of fact, that is our biggest fear. That is the, the biggest thing that we fear throughout this coronavirus. And this, this fear makes us act in different ways. You know, I, I, we have some family members who we've been talking to who, you know, they're, they're getting ready just in case anything were to happen to them. You know, so we've been having a lot of conversations with family members about their wills and, you know, what's going to happen if they do pass away or when they pass away eventually and uh, what's going to happen with uh, properties, what's going to happen with businesses, what's going to happen with all these different things, just guiding people through that and helping them in that. And, uh, you know, as a family, you know, me and my wife even had a, a discussion. We like to have a date night every week and you know throughout our date night this week we had a conversation as to you know what's going to happen to us what's going to happen to our family if we were the ones who were going to pass away you know how are we taking care of our family and you know we we have a will that we're working on preparing for our family just making sure that our family is secure and taken care of uh, but you know it's it's something that's on the top of everybody's mind you know the fear of death and you know, not only during times of national scare do we fear death, but there's rhythms in life that sometimes bring death to our mind. Like for example, when you're going through a midlife crisis, you know, maybe, maybe you're in that, that age that you're in your 50s and you realize that, man, half of my life is pretty much over. And I don't know what I, what I still want to do with my life. You know, people start going on trips. They start going on vacations. They start buying fancy, inexpensive cars. They start doing all these things because they want to get the most out of life before it's over. You know, and sometimes when you have a scare, you know, maybe somebody cuts you off in traffic and you have a flash of your life in front of you and you feel like that was a moment that you could have died. Or maybe it's a medical thing. You know, you go to the doctor and, you know, they're doing some routine scans and they tell you, oh, that, that doesn't look good. You know, we're going to have to do more tests. And you start thinking to yourself, could this be cancer? Could this be something that could affect my health? Could this make me die? You know, and this is a real thing. As a matter of fact, me and my wife went through the same exact thing once for me as well. I remember... Uh, uh, a little while back, a few years ago, I was in church, you know, uh, I was in a, a, in a church worshiping God. We had just gone uh, to, a, to a restaurant to eat some food and we went to, a, a, I believe it was a Saturday night service and we're just sitting there, we're worshiping God, we're getting ready to, to hear the word of God being preached and we're there, we're worshiping and all of a sudden I just, I just started to feel terrible. I didn't feel well, my stomach was turning, I started to feel lightheaded. You know, and, and all of a sudden, the, I started to feel dizzy, and the room started spinning, and I didn't know what was going on. And the next moment, I found myself on the floor. I had fainted, like I had passed out at that moment. And it wasn't like a like a Holy Spirit slaying in the spirit type of thing. It wasn't that type of church, right? But I had fallen because of a real medical emergency. Something had happened to me that caused me to faint. And, uh, you know, the people there at the church came and, and helped me out. And they, you know, they took my blood pressure. You know, they called the rescue. They, 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 they talked about it. You know, we're like, we're fine. We're not, we're not going to call rescue. But I did make it a point to go to the urgent care. You know, and as, as after having that experience where, where I had fallen, my wife seeing me fall and, and you know, not knowing what was wrong with me, uh, it's a little scary. You know, you start thinking about what could I have? What, what could have happened? Is it something dangerous? Is it something that's going to affect the way I live my life? You know, and, and, you know, we went to do the scans, got all this like 
plugs all over me to my brain to see if my if my brain was working correctly in my heart and all these different things and you know those moments can be very scary you start wondering if you are going if this is going to be the end if because of this you're going to experience death and for me this was a very real thing i mean my my grandmother on my dad's side passed away very young of at a very young age my dad had a stroke in his 40s and for me this was like a real thing that i was thinking about like could this be something that was going to affect the way i live or worse could this mean that I'm going to die from this experience. Now, you know, thankfully it was none of those things. As a matter of fact, the doctors really couldn't figure out what it was. They did all the scans, they did everything, and they realized that everything was normal and everything was fine. Uh, it, they said it was probably some sort of food poisoning that I got from the food I ate, whatever. But either way, it made me realize that life is short. You know, my wife had been trying to get me to do this diet and, uh, you know, trying to, trying to stop eating meat and do vegan. And I was like, I will never do that. But after that scare, I was like, I'm willing to try anything. I need to get healthier. I'll do whatever you want so that I could be healthier. You know, because we want to prolong our lives. None of us want to die. None of us want to stop living our lives. And let me tell you that every single person at some point in their life is going to experience that thought. What's going to happen to me once I die? You know, uh, theologians, philosophers, even regular people all just think about this one question. What's going to happen once I die? Is there an afterlife? Is there anything after this death? Is there anything beyond this world? So people start searching. Maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you're searching. Maybe you're wondering, is there something more to life? beyond this and you know people go to religion they look at they look at reincarnation and be, becoming a, a cow when they come back or a flower or a bee or whatever it might be or they look at at, at different um states of of nirvana and getting to different uh existential places in their religion and they search for all these different things looking and trying to search out if there's anything beyond this life. And you know, many religions offer some sort of afterlife. They say there's something that's going to happen after you die. However, there's not a lot of evidence or there's not a lot of uh, confirmation that that's going to happen. Really, it's just wishful thinking. So how does the Christian message, so how does the, the message of Jesus' resurrection change that how do we have assurance of life beyond this life because of jesus how do we do that well the big idea for today is this i want you guys to write it down jesus came to give us freedom from death jesus didn't just talk about an afterlife jesus didn't say that once you die there will be something beyond that jesus himself took the punishment of death and he proved that he can come back to life even after death. And as we read in this passage, he was the pioneer of our faith. He showed us the way to defeat death. And that is what Jesus is calling you and I to, to experience the eternal life that he offers through his son, Jesus Christ. But you might be wondering, you know, how does Jesus give us freedom from death if every single one of us has to die at some point, every single one of us is going to die, Pastor Lewis. So how is it that Jesus gives us this freedom from death? Well, we're going to find out as we go through this passage here. And the first point I want you guys to write down is this. We will all face death. Every single one of us will face death. And that's point number one. We will all face death. You know, this is the reality of life. We are born, we live our life, and at some point, we're going to face death. You know, Benjamin Franklin was quoted as once saying, in this world, uh, nothing can be to be certain except for death and taxes. 
Those are the two things that are certain. And you know, the Bible echoes this statement. The Bible says the same exact thing. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews 9, 27, the author of Hebrews writes, people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Meaning death is inevitable. There's nothing that we can do to prevent death from happening. It doesn't matter how many vitamins you take. It doesn't matter if you're doing the keto diet or the paleo diet or the Whole30 diet or a vegan diet. It doesn't matter how many push-up challenges you do or how many times you go to the gym. If you run a 5K, if you run a 10K, if you run a full marathon, it doesn't matter what you do. Every single person eventually in life is going to face death. We're all going to face death. And you know, some people might die young. Some people might die old. Some people might die of of disease. Some people might die of old age. But no matter what you die of or how old you are when you die, we are all going to have to face death at some point in our lives. And as I said before, everybody wants to know the answer. What's going to happen to me? After I die, once I no longer live in this body, where will I live? How would that look like? Will I, will I be a spirit? Will I be a little fluffy angel in a cloud playing a harp for the rest of my life? What's going to happen to me once I die? And the truth is, the sad truth is, for many people, death is the end of the line. That's as far as you can go. The, that's, that's as much life as you're going to have. So in light of that, if people know that and people realize that, people are going to live for this life and people are going to be afraid when it's over. People have a fear that once this life is over, that's it. And the sad reality is that for most people, that is true. Once you die, apart from Christ, you are dead and there is no coming back from that and that is a sad news to hear that's not something good to hear but you know as a christian as a person who believes in christ a couple days ago we we looked at how jesus washed us clean and gave us his righteousness and and set us free from slavery and for the christian death and that judgment is not the end As a matter of fact, I want you to write this down as point number two. Death is not the end. It's only the beginning. Write that down. Number two, death is not the end. It's only the beginning. What do I mean by this? Well, I think many of us have a fear of death because we feel like it's the end of something. It's the end of someone's life. It's the end of maybe our life. And if we're honest with ourselves, we really don't want this time to end. Let me, let me give you an example. I, I remember when I was uh, younger, when I was in high school, I started reading uh, the Harry Potter books. Any Harry Potter fans? Yes? In there? Yes? No? Okay. Anyways, I loved Harry Potter. I started reading the first book in my class. And then, you know, I got really into it and I started reading the second in the third book, and these were not small books. They were massive books. They were really big books. And as I would read them, I would get more and more into it. I would devote hours to these books. And as soon as I was done with a book, I would go on right to the next one because I didn't want it to end. I wanted to keep reading about Harry Potter, about Hermione, and everybody else in the wizardy world of Harry Potter. I wanted to know more about what was going to happen. And slowly I caught up to the books. And, you know, now we had to wait about a year before we got another book, right? Until eventually, finally, we got to read the last book, Harry Potter number seven, right? And as, we, as I finished reading that book, I was like, okay, this is it. It's over. This is the end. This time in my life that I had reading Harry Potter, it's now over. And, you know, I, in, in, that, in that space, in that vacuum of now what do I do with my time? 
I used to spend hours reading these books and now I got nothing to do. So what do I do? Thankfully, the movies came out and I started binge watching those movies and I used to love watching all those things. But eventually that time came to an end. You know, even now in, in, with my family, I, I like to share things with my family. And one of the things that's very special between me and my oldest daughter, Lily, is that we started reading The Chronicles of Narnia. It's a great book series written by C.S. Lewis. And we started, I wanted to go through the whole entire thing, and we started with The Magician's Nephew, which is really the prequel to everything that's happening in the, in the Chronicles of Narnia. And when me and my daughter got to the end of that book, as soon as we got to the end, my daughter was like, Dad, is that it? Is that the end? Is there no more of this? And immediately, as soon as she told me this, I'm like, I'm buying the whole series. So I bought all the books, I'm ready for whenever we finish the second one. We're like in the middle of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And she's so excited for what's going to happen. And I told her after we're done reading the book, we're going to watch the movie. And she's excited about that because it's a time where she gets to enjoy. But I know at some point, this is going to end. This time that I have with my daughter, this time that we get to read is going to end. And for us, seeing a time ending is kind of depressing. It's kind of sad. I mean, I remember when I watched the epi- all the episodes of The Office, one of my favorite shows, probably my favorite show, we watched the whole entire thing of The Office and how depressed we were when we finished because that was it. Like, what are we going to watch now? Maybe you're like that in Netflix. You've watched all of the shows that you wanted to watch. Tiger King is, is done. You've already gone on Disney Plus and you watch all of The Mandalorian and you're, you're in a show hole and you don't know what to do, right? And you feel like the world's going to end But the end of something doesn't necessarily mean the end of all things. So we feel the same way when our life is about to end. We don't like endings. We don't like for things to finish. As a matter of fact, we fear the ending of things. But for the Christian, death is not the end. It simply is the beginning of your new life in Christ. And that's encouraging, church. It's encouraging because even though all things must end, even though things must come to an end, all books must finish, all movies must finish, all TV show series must finish. You know, we we had to watch The Office twice, but you know, we finished watching it again the second time and it's finished. You know, now we're watching something else. But the truth is that with Christians, When our life is finished here on this earth, when our physical bodies decay and pass away, our life is not finished. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to give us eternal life. Jesus himself, talking uh, with, with the religious people, he tells them this in John 5, 24. He says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Notice how he puts it, has eternal life. Not will get eternal life, not will someday inherit eternal life, but has eternal life. That's so encouraging, Christian. And he continues on, he says, and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So what does this mean? I mean, how can Jesus say that they will not, they will not experience death? How, will they, how have they crossed over from death to life if we all have to face death at some point? Well, here's what Jesus means. He says that if you believe in him, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you now have eternal life. And if we look at what eternal life actually means, means that your life won't end, that you will continue living forever. That's what eternal life means. So even though there might be a transition from you living in your physical body and now you living in a spiritual body, there still will not be an ending to your life. It'll just look a little different. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that if you are absent from your body, 
You are present with God. You are there in His presence. There is no death for the Christian. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus came to do. When we look at this passage here in, uh, in verse 9, it says that He suffered death. So by the grace of God, He might taste death for everyone. He took the punishment of death so that you and I would not have to face death. We will live forever. Now, that's great news. You know, the Bible says that if we are absent from this body, we're present with God. So we're eternal, baby. We're good. We're never going to have to face the death of our bodies, our, our physical bodies, yes, but we will never have to experience death. We have been given eternal life. Look at what 1 John 5.11 says. John, writing this in his epistle, he says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. He's already given it to you. You already have it. It's part of your possession. You're living your eternal life right now if you're a believer in Christ. And it says, And this life is in His Son. So for us who believe in God, for us who believe in the sacrifice of Jesus that paid for our sins and He raised from the dead, death is not the end. Now you might be thinking to yourself, all right, you know, that sounds very nice and all, and that sounds very uh, futuristic, but, you know, Pastor Lewis, all these other religions claim to have eternity, claim to have some sort of afterlife after this life. So how, how do I know, like, what's the proof that I know that we will have eternal life? Well, Jesus is the proof of your eternal life. Jesus himself is the, all the proof you need about us being eternal creatures. See, not only are we going to live in spirit once, once our physical bodies die, but Jesus Christ is also going to resurrect our bodies. This body that we have, even though it's perishable, the Bible says in, 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 in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that it will be sown perishable, like we're going we're gonna to go into the ground, but it will be reaped. It will be taken out of the ground imperishable with power, with glory. God is going to redeem our bodies and He's going to combine our spirit and our body together again to be restored. So we are never going to stop existing because we are eternal people. And how do we know? that we're gonna get this body? Well, Jesus modeled it. Jesus himself was dead. He legitimately died. He was dead, he was buried. Like there was no, um, there's no questions about his death. Jesus died. And then Jesus resurrected and his body that he had was something like you and I are going to be given at the resurrection of all the bodies. We're gonna have a body like Jesus is. And I want you to write this down as point number three. Jesus pioneered the way to eternal life. Jesus pioneered the way to eternal life. See, just like the great pioneers, the people who were explorers like Lewis and Clark, you know, going to, to search out the West and trying to find all the way to the Pacific and they led people and they, they saw the way, they marked out the path and they, they helped people to make that journey along with them. Just like Christopher Columbus went out from, from, uh, from where he was at in Europe and he went all the way and discovered the Americas and brought people afterwards, showed them the way, showed them what was there. In that same way, Jesus lived a life that you and I could never live. He lived his body, he lived in a human body. He lived, he had the same exact temptations that you and I had. He suffered through everything that you and I have, and yet he remained perfect. And then he died, just like every single one of us is going to die at some point. But the difference here is that since Jesus was perfect, he defeated death. So basically, he pioneered into death and found a way out. Look at what it says in our passage here in verse 14. Since the children, meaning us, since you and I, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity 
So basically, Jesus came to be just like us. He needed to be human, just like us. Shared in the humanity so that by his death, his dying on the cross, him physically dying, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. You could basically say that Jesus executed a prison break, right? With a little spoon and he got out of, out of prison and he said, Hey, everybody, come with me. I found a way out. And that's essentially what Christ did. He broke through the power of death. He defeated the, the, the he broke free from death. And he says to you and to me, come with me. I found a way out. I face the fear, uh, I face the foe of death so that you would not have to face him alone. And that's exactly what Christ does for us. Meaning that Jesus defeated death. He broke out from the power of death, and because of him doing that, now because of his resurrection, now we have a model, we have a pioneer who showed us the way to be free from death. As a matter of fact, um, you you might be wondering like, okay, that's, you know, Jesus resurrected, that's great, but like, where is the proof? Like, I mean, I've heard that Jesus resurrected, but isn't that just like a story? Well, let me tell you, it's not just a story. It's a proven fact. It's something that has been confirmed. See, the way that you confirm things is through witnesses. In, in a court of law, like we saw on Friday, one of, the re, one of the ways that you can determine somebody's guilt is if there's witnesses to prove that a person actually committed the crime. And in the case of Jesus' resurrection, there were witnesses who saw Jesus be resurrected. They saw him alive after they had seen him dead. As a matter of fact, at one point, over 500 people saw him at once. This is a, a fact that Jesus defeated death and he resurrected. And Jesus did not resurrect like every other person who was resurrected in the Bible. Because there are a couple of other people who resurrected in the Bible, who Jesus came, touched, and they came back to life. But those people, they died again. Lazarus, when he came out of that grave, eventually Lazarus had to die again. But Jesus defeated the grave. He became alive, and he still lives today. And that is the proof that you and I need to know that we will have eternal life. Matter of fact, uh, there's, there's a lot of great books that have been written about the resurrection of Christ. And one of those books, one of the, a very popular one is uh, this one here. It's called The Case for Christ uh, by Lee Strobel. And uh, what's, what's interesting about this book is that this guy did not set out to prove Jesus' resurrection. That was not his plan. As a matter of fact, this guy was an atheist. He did not believe in Christ at all. He wanted to prove that all of this stuff about the resurrection was wrong. And he believed that if he could prove that the resurrection did not actually happen, then he could prove that the Christianity is just a lie and there's no need to follow it. But through his research and through his following up of people, he realized that the resurrection had to have happened. And because of that, he actually became a believer and wrote a book and wanted to share with the world his findings. So I recommend this book. Also, if you're not a book person, you could find it on DVD. They have uh, movies about this. So great read. I recommend it for you if you still have doubts about Jesus' resurrection. But that puts us in a unique spot. See, we realize that we're afraid of death and we have to face death at some point. But now knowing that when we do face death, death is not the end. Death is just a stopping point between here and our, and our next breath. We, we take our last breath here on earth and we take our first breath in heaven in the presence of Jesus. And like I said, He is going to eventually redeem us in the resurrection. He's going to bring us back in our physical bodies. He's going to create a whole new heaven, a whole new earth. He's going to redeem the world. That's His plan all along. 
but he's waiting for you and for anybody else who does not know him. See, Jesus came to give us life, but it's, it also says that he is waiting on wrath so that the fullness of the people who are going to believe in him has come to pass. So he is waiting for you to give your life to him. So I encourage you, and I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this message to give your life to Christ. But then how do we respond? How do we respond in light of our eternal life? Well, the, the way that we respond to that is we need to live for our eternal life. Romans 12 tells us, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, having a new mindset about life, knowing that you no longer live a temporary mortal life, but you are now an eternal person that's going to live forever. And those are great news. So how do we live our life for our eternity? Well, I got three quick things. We're not going to go too into it, but I got three th quick things I want to tell you. Colossians, first of all, 3, 1 through 2 tells us this. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of this earth. So the first thing I want to tell you is make God your priority. Stop worrying about the, the things of this world. Are, do I have the bigger car? Do I have the bigger house? Do I have all these amenities? Do I have all these things? Worry and focus on your relationship with God. Make God your priority. That's how we live in light of that. Number two, develop spiritual muscles. You know, sometimes we go to the gym. I know the gyms are closed right now, so we're doing those push-up challenges. We're trying to stay active. We're trying to stay healthy. And the Bible actually has something to say about training up your physical body. In 1 Timothy 4.8, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, for physical training is of some value. Like you're going to, you know, working out is good for you. You're going to be healthy. You're going to live a little bit longer. You're going to have a good, healthy life, right? But he continues on and he says, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for the present life, the life we're living right now, and the life to come. So work on godliness. Develop those spiritual muscles. Develop your faith. Develop your trust. Develop your relationship with Christ. Develop your love for others. Develop your love for God. Those are the things you need to be working out. Not just your muscles, right? We just we don't only need to get big. We also need to get big spiritually, right? So uh, number three, the last thing I want to share with you guys store your treasures in heaven store your treasures in heaven we all know that when we pass away all of the treasures all of the things that we have in our lives all of this physical material stuff that we have somebody else is going to get it somebody's going to end up with your stuff somebody's going to play with your toys somebody's going to get your xbox somebody else is going to get those things when you are no longer here Whatever riches you store up for yourself, whatever treasures, whatever you have that is stored up here on earth is going to be given to somebody else because you can't use it anymore. So then how do I live in light of that? Well, I need to store up those treasures not here on earth, but up in heaven. So then how do we do that? How do we send our treasures to heaven to wait for us there? Well, there's a few ways that we do that. The first, the first way is you need to store up, up treasures in heaven by loving others. Loving other people is one of the ways that God is going to reward you. He says that every act that's done in this earth out of love is going to be rewarded in heaven. He also says to share the word. Share the, the message of the gospel to other people. That is a way to earn rewards in heaven. Share your faith with people. Share what God has done for you. Tell them how God has cleansed you of your sin and how you now are free from sin, from condemnation, from death. Share the message of Christ with others. And lastly, by standing firm through trials. See, we all are going to go through trials like we're going through right now. We're at home. We're dealing with this coronavirus thing. And now we need to stand firm through these trials, 
through these things that come our way. This is another way that we can store up treasures for ourselves in heaven. So ultimately, live for heavenly rewards. Do not live for this earthly life. And just to conclude, to wrap all this up, the big idea, the big thing that I want us all to realize is this. Jesus came to give us freedom from death. He came to pay the price that we could not pay. He died for us so that we could be eternal creatures. That even though we face death, we may not fear death because we know that it's not the end, but it's only the beginning. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask you, I'm going to